Welcome to this Roots Tech Connect demo entitled Tips and Tricks for Attaching Hints. I'm Robert Kerr, Senior Product Manager at Family Search, and I hope in the next few minutes to provide you with some ideas and, and tips for identifying the hints in our system and getting those records attached to your ancestors to document their lives. While this demo is meant for someone with beginner to intermediate skills, I'm not going to say much about what hints are. If uh, you're unfamiliar with hints, I recommend you go look at a presentation called Finding Your Family with Hints by a dear colleague of mine, John Huff. In that, he'll explain how they're generated, where to look for them, how to evaluate them. I'm going to dive right in working with my family and show you some of the ways to find the most hints and how to attach various different types of hints. So I recently had some spare time, and rather than completely waste it on YouTube or Facebook, I decided I'd log into Family Search. I came over to the family tree, and you can see my grandfather and grandmother, Howard and Bridget, who I love, they were awesome people, here in the middle of the tree. And I had a, a desire to go find some records for my ancestor. I thought it'd be fun to look at them and then attach the ones that I thought were real. Normally I would use hints to do that, but when you look at my tree, I've already spent so much time in here, it doesn't really matter which line you go up and down, I've already cleared all the hints off. Because, uh, quite frankly, it's a very addictive and fun thing to do. And so what's a guy to do? Well, I realized that when I look at the tree in this view, the landscape view, I'm really only seeing a small portion of the breadth and depth of the tree. Take, take for instance, my great-grandfather, my grandmother's dad, Andrew Henry Gajewski. His dad was Bart. And in Bart's family, Andrew had a bunch of siblings. What I am realizing here is that in looking at the tree in this view, I'm really only seeing a small portion, only one-seventh roughly, of Bartholomew's family. And so my first tip is the following. If your intent is to resolve hints, and the easiest way to do that is in the more recent records, Click on the name of an ancestor in the early 1800s to late 1700s. The reason I put that date range in place is that if you go back into the 17, 16, 1500s, the records are more scarce and they're often a little more difficult to read and deal with. So if you choose an ancestor in the early 1800s, in this case uh, I have Bart in 1839, and then click on his name, it's going to pop up the person card, and then choose tree in the bottom left hand corner there of the person card. What that's going to do is it's going to move Bart to the middle of the bow tie here where my grandparents are. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And now it'll redraw that. You can see Bart pops into place there and I can see all of his kids. The next thing to do is to come up here in the left hand corner and where it says landscape, click on that. It's going to drop down and let you see the other views of the tree. I love the landscape view, but I'm going to switch into descendancy view. It'll redraw that tree, and now I can see Bart and his wife Victoria and all of his kids in this kind of a format. Step three, after you've switched into descendancy, is to click on this little number four. Notice that I'm only really seeing one generation below Bart right now. But if I click 4, what it's going to do is it's going to automatically expand a bunch of these arrows and it's going to show me all of the descendancy generations below Bart, at least 4 out. And you can see I have Bart and Victoria, there's Joseph and Marianne, and their son Arthur and his wife Claire and their child Richard. And, and so this is a great view, but it's got a lot of scrolling. And most of the people that I'm going to be dealing with don't have portraits. And so the next step to let me see the most data in the most condensed format is to come over here in the top right corner, click on options, and then I'm going to turn off some of the things that are showing. The first thing I'm going to turn off is portraits, and watch when I do that. It's just going to collapse it beautifully, and I can see a lot more data in a lot less space. I'm also noticing there's some other great tools here like research suggestions and data problems, but they're not really my intent today. My intent is to find records, so I'm going to go ahead and turn those off so they're not cluttering up my screen. Now I've got a great view, I can see a tremendous amount of data. What I did is I found an ancestor, in this case my great-great-grandfather in the early 1800s. I clicked on his name, I popped up the card, I put him in the middle of the tree, and then I chose Descendancy up in the top left switched it to four generations 
and then in the options tool I turned off some of the things that I don't really need now by doing that you can see as I scroll I can see a lot more hints and look at these these are awesome right here I can take a look at some really good hints and uh, go take a look at those records okay so with the descendancy tool open all the stuff hidden four generations there I'm gonna start scrolling and looking for those blue icons and I see an Edward Lawrence Wozniak born in 1907 he has a blue icon here and when I click it it pops up I see there's two hints and they're both are both US censuses I love the census records because they're great records to find additional family members in what I've learned though not knowing a whole lot about Edward Wozniak's family that it's always good to become familiar with the people you don't want to be attaching records uh, incorrectly and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on his name I'm gonna click on the person here and it's gonna take me over to his person page where I can get become a little more familiar with him his parents and siblings it looks like Edward was born in 1907 uh, the tree indicates that his father was Valentine his mother was Rose that he had a sister named Clara and if I look at the locations, it looks like they were living in Detroit, Michigan. If I look up at the top right, there's those uh, hints that we saw on the other page, the 1930-1920 census. And looking at what the record says, I can learn that, again, this record is from Detroit, Michigan. That the record indicates a head of household, Valentine, a wife, Rose a son Edward and a sister Clara. So I have to ask the critical question that you should always ask yourself. What is the probability that in the year 1930 there was a different family completely unrelated to this one with a, a father named Valentine, a mother named Rose, a last name or Rizniak, who had two children Edward and Clara living in Detroit, Michigan? And my assessment is that's pretty improbable the likelihood that this record actually pertains to this family is is almost certain so I want to go ahead and, and attach that now I could just click review and attach but let me show you a quick tip clicking any of the hints will always pop up the record card and that's terribly useful as we just saw but if you're ever a hundred percent confident that this record pertains to the person in the tree and you just want to get over to the source linker really quickly if you hold down the command key on a Macintosh or the control key on a PC when you click the name it will take you directly over to the source linker without popping up that record card and that'll save you a click in a moment of time over in the source linker I can see Edward lined up with Edward I have his parents lined up and Claire is lined up here on the left hand side is all the information from the record in the 1930 census and on the right hand side it's lined up with the data that we just saw in the family tree now I have found that when working with census records it's always a little easier to understand what you're looking at when the head of household is the person here in the middle in the focus position so rather than attach Edward what I usually do is I attach the head of household first I'm gonna click compare on Valentine I put in the names dates places and relationships match that's usually a good uh, sufficient reason statement and then I'm gonna click attach Okay, it turns Valentine green. Now, like I said, I want to get Valentine, the head of household, in the middle. And here in the middle of the focus person, there is a little change person tool. Clicking on that pops open all of the folks that are in the record. And if I click Valentine, it's going to redraw the source linker with him in the center, his wife Rose below, and then all of the children right below that. For me, it's a minor thing, but it makes it a little bit easier to understand what I'm looking at so I can go ahead very quickly and just attach the rest of the family notice that when I add the residence brings it over and I have the opportunity to standardize the place if necessary people ask what does that mean and it means that we've made the the places all kind of uniform across records and tree people it makes it much more accurate and easy to search and less ambiguous about places so in this case it already recognizes the date and standardized the place and date for me and I can just go ahead and click attach also notice that it put the reason statement the system propagates that forward so if you put a decent one in you don't have to type it in each time I click attach rose turns green and I can do the same for Edward and Clara what I would like to do is go ahead and add Marie the daughter uh, of Valentine she's apparently in the record but not in the tree if I click add what's gonna happen 
is the system takes all the information from the record, Valentine, Rose, Marie, all the siblings, everything, the dates and places, and it goes and looks to see, is there a Marie Wozniak already in the tree somewhere? So rather than creating a new person, we could just bring that Marie in and insert her into this position. And in this case, it didn't find any existing Marie Wozniak so it prompts me to create a new person. And notice that it's brought over all the information from the record. It tells me it's brought the name, the date of birth, the birthplace. Um, it's indicating that she's deceased and it's basing that on the fact of her age, born too long ago, sorry, to uh, be still alive. And when it's letting me know here that it's gonna create a new Marie as a child of Rose and Valentine. So when I go ahead and click that, it spins for just a second, it creates my new Marie, adds her into that position, and then I can take the step of adding the missing information from the record. This is something a lot of people fail to do, is they fail to click that add button. We're attaching records for a reason. We wanna add all the details about the person's life and those details are found in the record. So don't neglect to click add and move over the information. I'm going to go ahead and click attach to finish connecting this 1930 census record to the newly created Marie. She'll turn green. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click compare on Edward and Clara and attach the census to them. And I'm going to go ahead and create William, Frederick, Rose, Grace, and Raymond in the tree and attach the record to them. Having done all that behind the scenes so that I don't bore you, that brings me to my next tip. I've just added about six new people to the family tree. And it takes the system, the hinting system, only a few minutes to take a look at new people and generate hints on those. So my tip to you is when you come up on a record like this and you add new people to the tree, I like to leave this source linker open for 10 minutes or so and then come back to it and I can click on any one of these individuals, jump over to the person page and look to see if new hints were found. Uh, based on having added them to the tree. My next tip for you has to do with attaching marriage records and particularly the use of this change person tool here in the middle. I found this really great marriage record for Julia Allor and Henry Marsh and in looking at it I noticed that the marriage date which is present in the record obviously is not present in the family tree. I also uh, went over to Henry's page and when I scroll down to look and see what we know about his family, I realized he doesn't have any parents in the family tree, and yet this marriage record uh, from Michigan does have his parents on there, so I'd love to add them. So this is a great find. Now, marriage records have a particular structure. The bride and groom are always in the middle, and the, with the bride is often the focus person, and the parents of the bride are listed above with the parents of the groom listed below. It might be a little different if you come in on one of the parents, but this is the typical structure. And what I found useful then is what I do is I will attach all four of these. I'll attach the bride in the record to the bride in the tree, the groom in the record to the groom in the tree, and then the parents of the bride. And so let me go ahead and do that. I'm gonna add my reason statement here and the names, the dates, places, and relationships match what is known from other records, okay? And then I'm gonna click attach, and that will turn green. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do that for each of the other people in uh, the top part of this record here. When I attach Mer Henry, I have the option of moving over the marriage date. It's in there twice in the record. I don't quite know why, but I'm just gonna choose one of those. I don't need to move both of them over because it's the same marriage event. And that gets everybody connected. And here's the tip. Now that I have Julia and Henry and Julia's parents all attached properly, the thing that I'll do is I'm gonna use this change person tool and I'm gonna move Henry into the focus position, which is the top of this middle section. By clicking on the change person tool, choosing Henry Marsh, what it will do is it'll redraw the source linker with Henry at the top, and it'll move Henry's parents from down here on the bottom and place them up at the top. At that point, I can go about attaching, or in this case, adding um, Henry's parents. Now notice Hen in the marriage record, it didn't list Henry Marsh as the name of the father, it only listed Henry. 
we can assume that the last name of Henry is probably Marsh given the culture and background. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in so that when I create the new Henry in the tree, it actually has the complete and accurate name of Henry's father. It goes ahead and creates him. I can attach that. I have another problem here with Henry's mother. Uh, the record doesn't list her complete name. It says Isabeth. We're pretty confident that the name is Elizabeth, and this might just be a typo in the indexing. So I don't feel at all uncomfortable with making that a correct name and leaving her maiden name as Jennings. So when I added Henry's mom and dad, I made sure the names were correct as I create them in the tree, and then I go ahead and do the attach. So again, by summary, what I've done is I attach the bride, her parents, I attach the groom, and then I switch, put the groom in the focus, which moves his parents to the top, and I can take care of them. You'll do that often in a marriage record. Now the complexity of all the many different record types and the relationship and household structures that might be present in them is truly mind-boggling. But the source linker tool was built with the flexibility to handle just about anything that you encounter in records. And I'd like to demonstrate that with this 1930 census record that I found for the household of David H. Smith and his wife, Sarah. Living in the household are four of their children, Frank, Alice, Henry, and Sarah. Notice that Alice has a married name and so does Sarah. If I scroll down, I noticed that living in the household is Alice's husband, Guy J. Starks, listed as a son-in-law, and their child, Billy J. And Sarah's husband, Myron, is living in the household with their child, Raymond Mayhew, as well. Now, I'd like to get everyone attached up properly here in this record. I've already done so for David and Sarah and the four kids. But I noticed that Myron and Guy, they're not listed over here on the side. So how do you handle this kind of a complex situation in the records? One of the ways that you do that is, again, using that Change Person tool. If I come over to the Change Person tool and click on it, it's going to list all of the people that are present in the record. The green ones are the ones that are already attached. And I'm going to go ahead and try and do Alice Starks. When I click on her, what's going to happen is she's going to be moved down from this children on record section and placed into the person of focus position right here at the top of the expanded center section. And when it does that, it'll redraw. It brings in Joseph Guy Starks from the family tree. He's listed as the husband in the tree for Alice. Down below, I had Guy J. Starks. Now, it's not the same, and the source linker will typically try and bring up the spouse if it can, but given the difference in the name and the difference in the birth date, the source linker didn't assume that it could do that with confidence, so it left Guy down in the lower section. But that's not going to slow me down. Notice that when I mouse over Guy J. Starks, two little arrows appear over here on the left-hand side, and when I mouse over them, it says click and drag to realign with a family tree person. All I have to do is click on Guy J. Starks, and as I drag him up, the various positions that I can drop him in turn yellow. When I get him into the position that's correct, it turns yellow, and I let go of the mouse, and it drops him into place. Now, with him in the place, he's moved from the lower section, and I can go ahead and click Compare. Again, don't forget to always add in the information from the record, so I'm going to add the residence information. And I'm going to put in a reason statement here. Names, dates, places, and relationships match what's known in other records and in the family tree. And I'll click Attach. And Guy uh, Starks there will turn green. Now, their son was also in the household. Down here I have Billy J. Starks. Notice that in the family tree it says children from family tree 1, but it's not open. So if I click Open, it tells me that in the family tree, Billy Joseph Guy Starks is their son and that's probably the same person as Billy J down here. So again, all I have to do is click. I can drag Billy J up, drop him into position. When it turns yellow, I let go of the mouse, and I can go ahead and do the compare and attach. The reason statement is propagated forward again, and clicking attach, he turns green. All right, very quickly, I'm gonna go through and just do the same thing for Sarah so you can see it done a second time. I use a change person tool. I click on Sarah E. Mayhew. 
she's placed into the position. In this case, the source linker was confident enough to automatically bring Myron up. And so all I have to do is click compare, add in the data. The reason statement is there, so I can click attach. Myron will turn green. Raymond, their son, was also automatically brought up. And because this is a 1930 sentence, this, he was born in 1929 and would be about a year old, all of his siblings are in the tree, born after this census, but Raymond's not in there. So I'm going to go ahead and click Add. When I do that, it brings over all the information and asks me to designate, is he living or deceased? Now he was born in 1929, he would have to be still quite old to be alive, but he could be. And so the only thing I can do in good conscience, not having done any additional research to confirm or prove that he's already deceased, I'm going to go ahead and create a Raymond Mayhew, but I'm going to choose living. He'll be added to the tree. Only I will see him, but there is a place in the family tree where I can go to get a list of all my living people. And at a future time, I can come back and do some more research on Raymond and see if I can find a death record. He's created in the tree. I add the residence date and I click attach and he's now listed in there as their son and living. Perfect. Okay, I'm pretty much out of time, but I really got to show you two more cool little tips. When you're dealing with obituaries, uh, particularly these awesome records from Genealogy Bank, they can arguably be the most complex records you'll ever deal with. And in this case, I have a Genealogy Bank uh, obituary for Mr. Lewis Silverthorne. And because nobody in this record is connected, there's no, there's no connection right now between the record itself, the obituary, and the family tree. It's possible at times to get in a situation like this, and you can see I have Mr. Lewis Silverthorne here in the record in the focus position, but on the right-hand side from the family tree, it has his wife Lillian, and he's down below, and I need to switch these two. The tool I'm going to show you is useful to fix this kind of situation. It's also really useful if you find somebody in the record where, you know, like Aunt Mabel or something, she's not showing up in the tree. You know she's in the tree and you can find her PID, but it's really, she's in the record and it's really hard to figure out how do I get her into the right position. So I've got Mr. Lewis Silverthorne here in the focus, but I need to get Lewis here up into this position. One of the ways I can do that is to copy his PID. Now I could copy it from the tree, you know, if, if he was in the record but not showing up in the family tree side and I just wanted to force him into that focus position, the way I do that is to get his PID however I'm, I can get it and then come over to the change tool and I can paste his PID right into that go to box. And when I click the arrow, it's going to pull in that PID from the family tree and it's going to force align it into that focus position. And there we go. So now I have Mr. Lewis Silverthorne lined up with Lewis Aubrey and it, his wife is pulled in and everything is looking just great. And I can do the attaches. Now there's one other thing tip that I need to show you. In addition to the that tool where you can force align any kind of PID, um, you'll often end up in an obituary where one of the daughters is named for her husband. So I have this Mrs. Dwayne Monroe. Well I know that's one of his daughters. And from the tree, I can see his daughters, but I don't have their name. So what I can do is go look at each one of the daughters in the tree and see if any of them are married to a Dwayne Monroe. For instance, if I go to Vera here, um, if I command click, you know, I can pop up her card if I want. The trick is to hold down the command key command click it will reach out into the tree and load her page and if I scroll down I see well Vera is unmarried I don't have a Dwayne Monroe there so let's go to the next daughter um, I'm gonna pick maybe Doris down here and when their page is loaded I can scroll down and there's Dwayne Monroe so I know that Doris is the one that goes with Mrs. Dwayne Monroe and so I'm gonna use that tool that I just showed we're going to come up here and click on Mrs. Dwayne Monroe and we're going to drag that down to Doris and align it. And then I can go about attaching everyone the way I want. So the two additional tips is that 
change focus person on the right hand side allows you to paste in any PID and force an alignment so if you've got Aunt Mabel you can change up here choose Aunt Mabel in the record and then go find Aunt Mabel's PID in the tree and paste it in and you can force Aunt Mabel into that position and make the connection. In my case I had a cross match where Lewis was lined up with his wife and Lillian was lined up with Lewis and I was able to use that same tool and force Lewis into the right position. And then that second tip is if you end up in an obituary with something like this, Mrs. John Kish or Mrs. Bert Zeman, and you don't know which of the daughters it goes to, sometimes you can click on the daughters, go to them in the tree, and look to see who they're married to and figure out which one goes to the right person. Okay, thanks for spending a few minutes with me. I hope those tips and tricks will help you deal with all of the many record types that you encounter and make your attaching of hints much more interesting and successful. I wish you the best of luck in all of your genealogical efforts, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Roots Tech Connect.